Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Deanna Minnick, and I'm here to talk with you about the how of eating, understanding how stress and emotions impact eating behavior. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking about emotional eating. Truly, this is uh, something that many people have uh, in their daily life, something that they're confronted with and what they're um, really challenged by. And, and even for my myself, my own personal journey has involved a lot of emotional eating. And so I have uh, come up with a three-step process to really help with emotional eating. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about how these emotions come into our daily life and also stress. In a previous webinar, we talked a lot about stress and what stress does in the body. And so now that you have that good understanding, we're going to take it forward and start talking about food. So I also want to thank Harmony Hill Retreat Center because they're the ones that have sponsored this webinar for you. So if there's anything that you find very interesting in this presentation, please feel free to take that back to your healthcare practitioner and talk with them about the information and how that might be implemented for you specifically. This webinar is featuring only education for your own knowledge, for your own information, uh, but it's not meant to be prescriptive. So if we look at eating, it really has many layers to it, doesn't it? It's physical because that's how we get food and we take in food, we get energy um, after we've digested it. So eating is a very physical act, but it also has a lot of context around it. It's very social. We are usually eating with other people or we might come together in a meal setting. Um, and there are lots of exchanges. And even with the Mediterranean diet, one of the things that we see is that how they eat in the Mediterranean is in a more of a family style, lots of people, typically friends, and, you know, it's really a gathering. And then also eating is emotional. Eating is very emotional. Our emotions dictate what we eat, when we eat, how we eat. And so we will get into that how of eating piece that really speaks to the emotions and stress. And I would say that the how is almost as important as the what. You know, many times in nutrition we focus on have these foods, not those foods. And I think that that's all well and good. However, it's also important to focus on how we're taking in those foods. Are we being really mindless in eating them? Are we overeating, undereating, emotionally eating, stressed eating, rushed eating, convenient eating, whatever it is? We need to pay attention to that because, uh, as I mentioned in the previous webinar, how we eat is how we live. And how we live is how we eat. So it says something about your life um, when you look at your eating and, and what is happening there for you. So one of the things um, that is, is really important, and we did cover this uh, quite in depth in the stress webinar, we went into the physiological effects of stress. Some people just tend to be high stress reactors, kind of that type A type. And when we are high-stress reactors, we might tend to make poorer decisions around food and eating. Uh, a study that I found in the literature from 2007 essentially showed that um, studies, when we look at the culmination of studies, we see that chronic life stress may be linked to weight gain. So, and especially when we were talking in the stress webinar, we talked about a lot of belly fat. And that's correlated with cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So there might be a connection there between stress in your life uh, and, and perhaps weight gain. And maybe that's also because of the food choices we're making when we're stressed. So how did we get to this point of being emotional eaters? You know, it's a very intriguing question. I remember reading a statistic that said that over 75% of weight gain is due to emotional reasons. So I find it fascinating that we are in the midst of this obesity crisis, and perhaps there's an emotional component here that's being overlooked many times when we go on a diet. Many times on a diet we think, well, gosh, if I just eat these foods, I'll lose weight. And in part, that might be. But there might also be another part of this, which is more about looking at the why of eating, how we're eating. And how did we get to be like this? And I would say that with our busy lifestyles, it's really hard to be emotional. It's almost like we don't have the time to be emotional. And so if we're not 
feeling our emotions, we might be stuffing them down with food. So let's look at this word emotion. E, if you take a physics class, represents energy. And then, of course, we have motion. So it's almost like it's energy that has to be put in motion. We can't let it stagnate or get stuck. Because if it does, it might create some issues in the body. We might have um, some symptoms that come up, maybe anxiety or depression or even irritable bowel syndrome, which is very much connected to our emotions and our stress level. So emotions need to be fluid and flowing. And I remember hearing somewhere that the average emotion is it expresses um, over the course of 90 to 120 seconds, which means it's rather short-lived. And what we decide to do with that emotion, whether we run it through the gamut of our thoughts and our brain, will determine the effects on the body. One of the things that we can do um, is, and I have even learned this for myself through various spiritual traditions and yoga practice, is the whole idea of observing emotion. So just kind of looking at it when it happens and being curious, being curious about why you're feeling a certain way. And if we can just step back, almost like this state of loving detachment, kind of looking at ourselves and kind of saying, hmm, that's interesting that I got really angry about that. Or, wow, I got really sad when I heard that news. Or, wow, you know, it's really great that I can celebrate and feel this happiness about this event. So I think it's great just to have this um, idea of looking at ourselves as a, a vehicle for the expression of these emotions, what's coming out. And I often think of children, children, you know, stomping their feet, getting upset one moment, and then the next moment they're all about just love and, you know, they have forgotten because they've already expressed that emotion that they were having and that was bottled up within them. So observing emotion is one of the um, easy tools. Well, I would say I don't know if it's easy, but it is definitely a tool that can help us to um, stay in that state of presence. So um, as I mentioned before in the stress webinar, um, there are many manifestations of stress and emotion as it relates to disease. So it's almost like people will ask, well, what do I do? Do I just express everything I'm feeling every moment? Well, perhaps not so much. Um, there might be a happy balance there. Studies show that when you have impulsive venting of emotions and repression, that they seem to have very similar effects. So we have this kind of volatile display of emotions, which isn't really healthy, and it can really tax the system. And it can also bring on this feeling of guilt or, you know, just perpetuate more emotions. And then on the other side, if we're not saying anything, that can also lead to repression of, em of emotions. So both ways are not so good, which is why one of the, the easy tools that I do mention, and I do think that this is easier, is to make an emotional date with yourself. So when you are feeling really emotional, maybe throughout the day, but you're working and you're busy and you're doing things, it's like, oh, gosh, this is really inconvenient. I just can't feel this way right now. Thinking about when you can feel it and making time, setting aside time to really be in that emotional space is, I think, really healthy. Also, there are studies that show that um, 1,200 people in this one particular study um, who were able to learn techniques to change their mind and their emotions as it related to uh, managing stress and emotions that were coming through them tended to live longer than those in, uh, who had not learned those same techniques. So if you are seeing the screen, uh, you, you might be seeing a cartoon I'm showing with a man holding up uh, different placards of faces. One is a smiley face, one is a sad face. And he's showing um, the woman across from him, who you would assume is his wife, and he's showing her these pictures. And he says, you always complain that I don't know how to show my emotions, so I made these signs. So this is just uh, some funny commentary perhaps on perhaps even the gender differences in emotions. You know, there is much talk about how men and women display emotions, um, having good emotional communication, emotionally in intelligent um, communication is, is really important too. And, and how do we convey them? Because not everybody conveys emotions in the same way. 
How do we um, allow that communication to come forth in a way that it's received and can be properly dealt with? So one of my favorite books is uh, this book, Molecules of Emotion, by Dr. Candace Pert. And in this book, she talks about the whole field of what we would call psychoneuroimmunology. If we break apart that word, psycho meaning mind, neuro meaning nerves, immunology meaning nervous system. So this is the science of how the mind impacts the nervous system and the immune system. So it's, uh, gosh, really breaking ground, and it's, it's really where science is going. Uh, at least I have seen many more papers, scientific publications on this whole realm. So one of the things that she says in the book is anger, grief, fear. These emotional experiences are not negative in themselves. In fact, they are vital for our survival. We need anger to define boundaries, grief to deal with our losses, and fear to protect ourselves from danger. So we actually need emotions, right? It's not like we want to just cover them up. They serve a purpose. Anger propels us into some action. I really, um, I think anger can be a good thing. And when it doesn't manifest as action, it can lead to rage or maybe turned inward into depression. Grief, uh, we definitely need grief. And if we don't have the ability to release tears, we're not removing inflammatory cytokines. And fear, gosh, uh, you know, in our stress webinar, we talked all about the adrenal glands. If we don't have fear, how do we decide if we're going to fight or flee a situation if it threatens our survival? So all of these things are, are important. But now what is toxic? So now we talk about like where these emotions do become more negative. What Dr. Pert said in her book is it is only when these feelings are denied so that they cannot be easily and rapidly processed through the system and released that the situation becomes toxic. And the more we deny them, the greater ultimate toxicity, which often takes the form of, of, an, emo of an explosive release of pent-up emotion. So the problem is not the emotion. It's the buildup of the emotion. And then it just expresses like a volcano, and it comes out. And this is the classic story of perhaps you've heard about the, the husband, wife, or partners that um, get upset by small things that happen within the house, like um, getting upset about the toothpaste cap not being on. It's not really about the toothpaste cap. It's more about the dynamic that hasn't been addressed that's underlying um, that exchange. So one of the things that um, I have seen in the literature is that it's really important to identify what we feel. And if we don't identify what we feel, then we can't solve it. We can't really come to a closure or a place of feeling comfortable with the emotion. So one of the easy tools that you can use, and I'm, I'm really focused on tools in this webinar, what you can do, because it's not really an, uh, a very inviting place to be when we are feeling very emotional and then our eating is affected. It could, again, it could lead to changes in our body, in our body weight, uh, in our disease state, and so we need some, some general tools. So this uh, tool that I'm showing here is called the Feeling Wheel. If you just Google Feeling Wheel, you'll find it. Uh, and essentially, it's, it's a great tool because you look right in the middle and you see some very generic emotions like mad, sad, um, scared, and joyful, and peaceful, powerful. And then from there, you can kind of tease it out a little bit. So instead of saying that you feel sad, is it really sad or is it depressed? Is it lonely? Is it bored? Are you tired? And so teasing out that emotion specifically and saying, okay, what is it exactly that I feel? And the more that we can define it and really get into that space and, again, be curious, I think it can show us many things. Now, whenever we, um, if you think about it, when children are growing up and they're expressing emotions and they're having an outburst in the grocery store um, or wherever, you know, it might be very uncomfortable. And some of the messages that we might get as a result of our upbringing and even as an adult is to be quiet, to get over it, stop crying. Um, and here are some of the, the phrases that I have here. So I'll just read some of these. Um, get it together. Carry on. Just keep busy. Now, here's a very uh, popular one, especially for grief. Time heals all wounds. Keep a stiff upper lip. Stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about calling somebody crybaby, and just get over it. 
So when we have these programmed messages in us, it really doesn't make for a very good conducive relationship with our emotions. We almost feel like they get in the way. Like, aren't we strong enough to get past these emotions? Well, the emotions I see as messengers. They're a calling to something um, that can be much deeper. Now, typically what happens with feelings is we don't really feel them. We just talk about them. We try to intellectualize them. And that's one of the ways that we evade really dealing with emotions and emotional eating is we just kind of intellectualize and say, well, you know, I really shouldn't feel like that because this is what I see in the situation. And we start bringing our intellect into it. But feelings are not intellectual. They're um, they're much more visceral. They're more of the body. So the two don't really go together all that well. If we just express those emotions, maybe do something bodily or through writing, journaling, reflecting, talking with a friend, and then processing that somehow, maybe going even for a walk, um, that might help us to, to actually feel them. We might start crying um, rather than just talking them out and trying to put them to rest, put them in a box. Right, And that's where most people feel comfortable with their emotions. So typically the ways that we repress our emotions, many different ways, but we're focused in this webinar about emotional eating. But there are other ways. We might overeat. We might drink lots of alcohol. We might be a person that always keeps busy. I know lots of these people where they're just busy bodies. They're just moving all the time because if they stop, they might feel, and that might feel uncomfortable. Working excessively, uh, going to movies, watching lots of TV, reading fiction, uh, doing lots of shopping, keeping conversations superficial. So this is one of those, how are you? And then the other person says, fine. <laughs> and you know that they're not fine, right? It's You know that there's something there underlying that surface. Um, so these are some ways that we repress emotions. We just cover them up with, with different activities. And ultimately what can happen is our body starts taking it on. So we might start to feel more fatigued. We might feel depressed. We might just not talk about our feelings at all. We might start to blow up over minor things like back to that toothpaste cap. Or we might even have some stomach sensations, gut sensations, changes in bowel habits and even increased eating, because eating makes us feel comfortable, especially when we're eating things we like. And as a result, we don't have to think about all those emotions. So what I'd like you to do at this point, I'm going to do a little hands-on kind of a, an applied activity here. And I'd like you, I've got two columns of emotions. I have uh, on the left a number of things that most people would enjoy having that sensation of. So you can choose one of those, whether it's unconditional love, gratitude, joy, bliss, feeling satisfied, content, courageous, peaceful, enlightened, and generous. And if you just put yourself in that emotion for a second, even think about something that would lead you to feel one of these things. Sometimes we have to go back to a memory. And what you might feel in your body. I'd like you to feel what sensations you get. You know, do you feel, I know when I go into the place of gratitude or generosity, I really feel like my heart expands. I feel like all of a sudden I just feel open. I feel open in my chest area. It's almost like, I don't know, circulation is picked up or just in general, I feel much more open. For some people, they might feel tingling in their feet or they might feel um, just a, a good rush of energy in their gut area. So that just depends on where your bodily signs are. The other column of emotions that I have here, now these are the ones that aren't so comfortable to feel. And I'd like you to see how your body responds to those. So you can choose jealousy, rage, anger, grief, embarrassment, guilty, pride, despair, fear, and neutrality. So if I just pick any of these, and if let's just say I take embarrassed, I almost feel like this collapse in my, my neck, in my chest area, feeling embarrassed, you know, feeling that sense of, you know, hanging the head, uh, feeling um, like you just want to hide. So it's almost contraction rather than what I've just felt with the expansion of gratitude and generosity. So you can see how these emotions might impact your body, just even posture, and also symptoms. So what is emotional eating exactly? What is stress eating? This is where we start eating instead of feeling, or maybe we have 
negative feelings about eating. I know um, just even working and coaching people, what I have seen is that people just feel sometimes very fearful about what they're eating. And so, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of emotion around the whole experience, and we can't avoid eating. It's something we have to do every day. And so what are we bringing into those experiences? And on average, we're making about 200 decisions on what we're eating, how much we're eating, with whom we're eating, where we're eating, and all those questions uh, in our food and eating experience. So it can be very emotionally taxing. So I really do think, uh, if we bring it back and say, well, how did we get here? I do think that, in part, we have these busy lifestyles. We don't have time to feel. And what is valued in our society is not so much the heart, but the brain. And it's all about the intellect. How smart are you? And what kind of degrees? What are your credentials? Uh, rather than really focusing on uh, somebody's emotional health. We, we often think about mental health from the standpoint of being um, cognitively sharp, mentally sharp, right? I think many people are also out of touch with their bodies. They don't have a good sense of how they feel, and they're not connected to their bodies very well. They don't have good bodily awareness. So they're not really in tune with when they're feeling emotional. And also, it's just safer to block feelings with food than to feel. So we just drive those emotions down into the body rather than up and out. So modern-day eating is definitely... It's got all the qualities of setting us up for something really stressful and emotional, right? Because it tends to be very mindless, it tends to be excessive, many times just doing it on autopilot. And we're not really in touch with our physical body needs of when we're hungry. And so and when we're stressed, gosh, you know, one of the first things that we do is we reach for something that is going to taste good. So being on the run and living these convenient lifetimes uh, you know, it, it's it's pretty, um, it is stressful. It's almost like we're trying to accommodate the stressful life uh, into the the eating experience, and, and that looks in different ways. And I'm showing a picture here on the screen of um, the steering meal where there's a little contraption to hold a convenient processed food um, on a, a, a little uh, encased fabric on the, the steering wheel of a car so that it can be very easy to eat while driving. Well, that's not optimal, right? Dashboard driving, that's not really what we want to do. That's not um, putting us in bodily awareness by any means. Now, emotional eating would not be an issue per se, but it, it's connected to so many things that aren't healthy. Uh, it's connected to eating more, and it's connected to also having um, more of a negative emotion um, after we actually engage in an emotional eating event. So we seek out this whole idea of, um, uh, of emotional eating on, on some level because we want some distraction. It, it doesn't feel good to express that emotion. And if we were reaching for broccoli and kale and, you know, good healthy foods and vegetables, then perhaps it wouldn't be such an issue. But Typically, people are not eating those foods. They're eating high-energy, low-nutrient foods. They're eating cake and ice cream, salty, high-energy, dense foods like chips and soda, and sweets. You know, these are the things that make us feel better. So those are the things that typically get eaten when people are feeling emotional. So what are the other variations on emotional eating? Um, social eating, lots of fixations, phobias around social eating or feeling pressure there. Um, some people feel very bored, and so then they just start eating because there's nothing else to do. Cravings. Cravings definitely have to be mined so that people can figure out what's really going on there. Why am I craving certain foods? And why do I have this, this feeling of, of stress? And how is that impacting my eating? Many times people experience emotional eating because they are on a diet. And the diet, in and of, them, in, in and of itself creates the stress because you feel like you're deprived. You feel like you're in a box, like you're not free. And so people actually can experience even more emotional eating when they are restrained and they are on a diet. So there's this study, um, which is published in 2006, that showed that restrained eaters, meaning that they were on a diet of some sort where they couldn't eat certain foods, 
versus non-restrained eaters had greater emotional responsivity, greater neuroticism, greater anxiety, greater depression, and lower self-esteem. So more restraint, and if we feel like we can't eat certain things or we have to do something so strictly, we might actually have to keep ourselves in check on the emotion side. When we look at um, people with uh, various eating disorders like binging or um, just even anorexia, bulimia, think of all of these things. Uh, this study in particular was looking at bingers and showed that bingers experience greater fluctuations of anxiety and depression than people that don't binge. So there is an emotional component here in eating disorders, um, at least in this study. Overweight individuals experience greater fluctuations in anxiety, hostility, and depression than people that were normal weight. So maybe this could be telling us that emotions play into this. Now, I mentioned that people usually engage in emotional eating because it makes them feel better. But that feel better sensation is short-lived because what tends to happen is people have <clears throat> an even worse and more negative mood after the binge, after the emotional eating episode. So what ends up happening is then that guilt propels a whole other cycle of emotional eating. So let's spend some time, our remainder of the time together, really focusing on three steps to combat emotional eating. I think this is where uh, really the, the juicy stuff is. You know, what can you do about it? I mean, we all know that we have emotions. So how do we actually work with them? So again, these are the three steps that I've come up with <clears throat> that have helped me with my own emotional eating, which really stemmed back to uh, my teenage years when I felt like I couldn't have certain things, and so I started eating emotionally, I started binging, and I felt like I needed to find a way out of this. And so I spent my 20s and part of my 30s even working on this. I really found myself through food. It became a conduit of personal growth for me. And this is what I teach through um, my food and spirit business, is, is really how do we mine the, the depths of who we are through the food and eating experience. So that's, that's something that I've dedicated my life to, all because of my experiences with emotional eating. So let's break these down. So the first step in really combating emotional eating and coming to terms with it is, number one, to become aware, just to have a really good sense of bodily awareness. And I've been talking about that. And many times when people go through a cleanse or elimination diet, they get a sense of food triggers. They get a sense of how their body responds to food. And I think that that can be really good. Uh, it's almost like it's just a temporary withdrawal of certain foods in order to just clear the slate, clean the noise, and um, just kind of see where the body nets out. So when we are in touch with our body, we're going to be much more um, instinctual in our eating. We'll be able to recognize physical hunger versus emotional hunger. We'll know when we're full so we don't keep eating. And we're fully present, and so we can um, really know when to say yes to things and when to say no. Uh, one of the things that I find to be very good for bodily awareness and just helps people is um, to have protein. Protein can be very grounding. Typically, sugar and carbohydrate take us out and kind of make us more flighty. Initially, it gives us a lot of energy, but then in the long run, we can get kind of that energy dip and fatigue. And protein, and it doesn't have to be animal protein. It can be all kinds of protein, legumes, nuts, seeds, whatever you choose. But that protein gives us that sense of stability a little bit more. So first, um, when it comes to awareness, if we're becoming aware, we need to know, well, what does emotional eating look like? How do you know if you're eating emotionally? And it's pretty distinct. So with emotional hunger, typically it's very sudden. So there's an emotional event, and then all of a sudden you feel like, oh, my gosh, I've got to just, like, deal with this. I need to eat something. Uh, and maybe you're not even intellectualizing it. It's just something that happens automatic. And it's kind of absent-minded. It's not something that is calculated and well thought out. And typically the foods that are chosen, as I mentioned before, they're not, it's not a spinach salad with salmon or something. It's, it's more like, okay, more like ice cream or um, a soft drink or something that involves like hand-to-mouth, just quick, rapid eating. Um, and again, engaging the mouth, distracting oneself, 
And um, it's just urgent. You know, this is the kind of hunger where it's like, oh, gosh, you know, you just – maybe you do it in secret. Maybe you just go to the store right away because you just – you crave a certain food. And oftentimes it doesn't stop. Even when you get that bodily sensation that you're full, it just keeps going. And the downside of emotional hunger, again, as I mentioned, is that it promotes guilt. So what ends up happening is that you get the guilt – which leads to um, potentially another whole round of binge eating, emotional eating, because now it's the guilt that's fueling the cycle. Now, what does physical hunger look like? How do we recognize when we just need food, we need energy for the body? Well, physical hunger is very gradual. It's open to a variety of different food. It's not fixated on one particular food. Typically, it's based in the stomach. It's very patient. It rises gradually and it comes out of physical need not an emotional event and typically there's a stopping when one is satisfied so it's a need for eating for energy so physical hunger and emotional hunger this is a good way for you to distinguish where you're at and also what are the choices that you're making are they good conscious food choices for you in that moment Boundaries, I think, um, I want to bring up a discussion about boundaries here as we're talking about the body and becoming aware of the body. Um, one of the things that I work on with people is really the whole idea of boundaries. And many times we don't have a good sense of our boundaries as it relates to our relationship with food and eating. And what is a boundary? It's a limit to how far we can go with comfort in a relationship. It um, is the the barrier or the line that we draw where my physical and psychological space are and where where um, they're separate from somebody else. And what I have seen is that many times people just lose their sense of boundaries with food. Um, and so they just kind of, they cave into uh, social settings that may or may not be good for them to engage in certain foods and eating. Um, they don't have a good sense of just knowing what serves them because they don't have a good sense of their body. And if they have a good sense of their body and they're bodily aware, then they have a good sense of those boundaries. So if somebody has uh, an issue with boundaries in eating, it might look uh, different. It might manifest in different ways. It might be that somebody says, oh, I have difficulty saying no. Um, I definitely have seen patients have difficulty. They know that they can't have certain things, but... They just have them anyway, and they just kind of deal with the consequences. And in, in some ways, they are bodily aware, but they're still moving forward past the bodily wishes. Um, I have difficulty asking for what I want or what I need. I have a hard time knowing what I actually feel. I'm overly sensitive to criticism. Just some, some general things about boundaries. So healthy boundaries overall, not just with food or eating, um, is that we have a good sense of presence, we're aware, we're appropriate, we're protective, we're firm in what we're saying. And, um, you know, again, it's reflective of where our body is in the moment and we're able to respond with proper communication. So there are many different ways for you to practice this. You know, here are some situations where we might cave and not really be uh, in tune with our sense of awareness. So here are some uh, three situations. So the first one is your grandmother offers you a piece of homemade birthday cake. You know that if you eat it, you're going to have joint pain afterwards and won't be able to work for at least two days. So what do you do in that situation? What do you, how do you cultivate boundaries? How do you learn to say no or um, create some alternatives? Here's another situation. Your friend has started following the Atkins diet and feels great. He wants you to get started on it, but your doctor wants you to be on a vegetarian diet. What do you choose for yourself, and how do you talk with your friend? Right? We're always put in situations where we have to um, form a boundary or form um, really a response based on what we know about ourselves, our health, and our body. And, and really being the judge of that rather than just to be swayed by everything on the outside without really having a good sense of being grounded in, in bodily awareness. And then a last um, situation here is a friend you haven't seen in a long time invites you to her favorite restaurant, which you are familiar with. You know that the restaurant has a limited number of healthy items. The menu listings available are those that have mixed healthy items. How do you handle the situation when you know that you're going to go to a restaurant that won't have options for you. So, again, it's just another way of how you can be creative, 
through your sense of bodily awareness. How do you take that situation and uh, transform it? Maybe you make a recommendation for a different restaurant or um, maybe you eat more ahead of time. But this is something that I really see that people struggle with. And when we are vulnerable in these situations, this is when we can succumb to emotions and to stress. And then we start eating anything and then we don't feel so good. The, the second piece of becoming aware, separate from the body, is, is really to focus on the emotions, as we have been talking about. And so identifying those emotions and expressing them. And there are many ways that you can identify emotions. I mentioned the feeling wheel, so to be really specific on what you're feeling. And, you know, many times, again, we just kind of brush things aside and say, well, you know, that's not so important. I need to get over that. But these little and important hurts do stack up. And if we don't acknowledge them, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my gosh, a massive attack of anxiety or depression. I think it's important um, for, for many people to journal or use a, an emotion log to help them. So as I mentioned, identifying feelings is key. Being able to define them, making sense of emotional states can help with emotional regulation difficulties and even what our eating responses are. So in general, if you start doing some work on emotions, you start finding out um, there are different schools on this, but there is this um, school in, in looking at kind of the psychology of our emotions and kind of bucketing them into two different camps. That's either part of uh, it's a love-based emotion or it's something connected to fear. So even anger, guilt, shame would all be connected to fear. So why, if we just look at the root, if, if, we, if we say, well, why do I have fear? Why do I have fear about this? What's really going on there? So our bodies take on emotions. You know, 60% of how we communicate comes through our body. Sometimes we don't even realize that we have certain um, expressions appearing on our face. It's just that, again, the emotions are so powerful and they just kind of come through. So um, to that piece, I wanted to mention, too, about flow in the body that with emotions and becoming aware of emotions, allowing them to flow through us, one of the things that we can be thinking about is, um, when it comes to food, is making sure that we're adequately hydrated. When we're adequately hydrated, typically our hunger signals aren't as strong. And um, even fats and oils that are more flowing, we think of omega-3 fats. I spent a lot of time talking about omega-3 fats when we were talking about inflammation in a previous webinar. And the omega-3 fats are great because they're reducing inflammation, and the inflammation might be connected to something emotional as well. So you can see that there's that whole interconnection. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, when we're feeling a certain way, uh, we can feel it in the body. And one of the places, just like for me, I feel a lot in the heart, and there's some great research that shows that when we are feeling a certain way, maybe we're frustrated, it will show in the heart rate. So the heart rate rhythm will look very jagged. Uh, when we are in states of appreciation or gratitude or love, there's kind of this nice soothing curve that forms in the heart. So the heart doesn't lie. It's really hard to, and that's why things like a lie detector test where, you know, you're essentially tapping into the heart rhythm and, and looking to see how the body responds because it's really difficult to alter that when you feel something. So there's a lot of great research on that. Uh, a lot of great research on the, on the heart that has been done by HeartMath. I really love that organization. They talk about how when heart intelligence is engaged with positive emotions, it can lower blood pressure, improve nervous system function and hormonal balance and even facilitate brain function. So isn't that something that when our heart's in alignment with feeling good, it's like all of our other body systems feel good. And they talk about when your heart is filled with loving appreciation, those feelings affect your body's electromagnetic field, causing it to extend three or more feet from the body. So you have this feeling of expansion. So this is just a portrayal of what that looks like exactly. And um, they've actually done some research where they have measured the field around the heart. We actually do emit a certain uh, electromagnetic um, radius around us. And that can, you know how sometimes when you're standing close to somebody, you can kind of almost even feel what they feel. Um, so that's where this is connected to, that the people that are close to us physically, 
we might be picking up on, on some of the things that are happening within their heart. So when I think of the heart, I think of vegetables. <laughs> I think of what expands and opens the heart, helps with circulation, oxygenation, and a lot of those dark green leafy vegetables are wonderful for that very purpose because they contain chlorophyll, they contain vitamin K, vitamin C, so many good nutrients to really help with that expansion. Uh, the other part of becoming aware is um, to become aware of stress. And that is one of the features that I think is, again, oh so important for uh, looking at our chronic disease state or if we have just stress in our lives. The more that we become aware of it, then we can create some coping mechanisms and ways to manage it better. And as part of stress, what we see, and I've talked about this in the stress webinar, it's a lot of issues with imbalanced blood sugar. So insulin and cortisol are kind of doing that tango back and forth. So what the studies show is that um, when people have high cortisol reactivity, they would have greater food intake. So if your stress level is high, chances are you're going to have more food intake. You might have more eating uh, that is emotional, um, more disinhibition with, um, with more stress. And this has all been uh, talked about in various scientific articles. So it's really important to get a handle on stress. Positive emotions and smooth heart rhythm patterns facilitate cortical or higher brain function. So really important to keep ourselves in the mode of positive emotions to help our brain, not just our heart, but our brain. Uh, stressful emotions and disordered heart rhythms inhibit a person's ability to think clearly. So one of the benefits of getting stress in check is really for better heart health and better cognition, two things that people care a lot about. Also, um, I did mention in the stress webinar, talk, we talked just a little bit about eating disorders, and, and one of the stress hormones, cortisol, uh, has been shown to be high in women with eating disorders. So that tells you right there that there's some stress component that definitely needs to be addressed. Cortisol and weight gain, um, and again, many times what we see, as I mentioned very early on when we first started this webinar, is that when we see a change in our eating, typically we see a change in our bodies in some way, right? And so, or our living. If we change our living, we change our behavior and habits, and we get a, perhaps we are in a stressful job. This increases cortisol. This can change our eating pattern, which can ultimately change our ability to um, uh, gain weight or not. So cortisol in and of itself is a stress hormone, increases blood sugar and promotes weight gain. It converts protein to blood sugar. And um, it also leads to the loss of protein in the body. The, bo the protein starts to uh, catabolize or break down. And so that becomes an issue because then we start to have more fat relative to muscle in the body. When we are relaxed, and this is good news, when we are relaxed, it helps to reduce emotional eating. So just doing some simple relaxation training has been shown to be effective in reducing emotional eating episodes as well as depression and anxiety symptoms and improving perceived self-efficacy for eating control, feeling like you really have control of the situation. We also know uh, from this study that relaxation is more important than thorough chewing. So when they looked at how important is relaxation compared to even chewing food well, studies show that it was more important to be relaxed than even to chew well. And of course, it's best to do both. Um, but if you had to choose one or the other, it's so important to be relaxed when eating. So when people have issues with blood sugar, this can set them up for cravings. So it's really good, number one, again, to become aware of where you feel, how you net out with your blood sugar. So when people have euglycemia or have steady blood sugar levels, not a lot of people report having cravings, about 15% of people. So there might be other issues going on there. But when somebody has low blood sugar, then their cravings go up to 65%. So that's, that's quite a jump. And if we're always in high and then low blood sugar all throughout the day because we're eating certain foods that spike our blood sugar, chances are we're going to be more prone to cravings. So here's where we start thinking about powering up with complex carbs, having carbohydrates that don't spike our blood sugar. 
So if you do things like grains, making sure that they're whole grains, they're not processed. I also think of legumes. Um, I just think of things that are high in fiber. And so we address this uh, in other webinars, talking about fiber, talking about carbohydrate. And, uh, you know, there are certain carbohydrates that can be very healthy. Sugars, on the other hand, are going to create an issue with our blood sugar. So there are many names of sugar out there. You have to read the labels. Make sure you get my book, An A to Z Guide to Food Additives, because it's, it's just a nice little pocket guide. So when you go to the stores uh, to buy food, you read the labels, you understand what you're actually buying. And really, optimally, you're not buying food with a lot of labels. It's just intuitive, and, and you know what you're getting. But there are many different names of, of sugar to be on the lookout for. And um, artificial sweeteners as well could have a lot of neurological behavioral effects, could have changes on our moods, changes, especially because we're learning that some of these artificial sweeteners might impact our gut microflora, and our gut microflora ties into our mood and our sense of anxiety. So if we're changing our gut through these artificial sweeteners, chances are we might even be more prone to different types of emotional upsets or emotional eating uh, episodes. So one of the ones that um, that I don't like very much in terms of artificial sweeteners is Splenda or sucralose. Uh, and if you look at the structure of sucralose, it uh, looks like sugar. It's a disaccharide, but it has chlorine attached. So um, it has three chlorine atoms. And so, you know, not perhaps such a great thing. It's It started out, um, if you look at the development of sucralose, it, um, there were scientists, and they were trying to find and make an insecticide. They ended up with sucralose. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't give the artificial sweeteners a very high rating in my food additive book. Furthermore, um, these sugar substitutes, many people think that they're, that they're okay, that, you know, if they have diet drinks, that that saves them from the effects of those sodas. And it doesn't. Uh, and actually, some of the, the research coming out is showing that uh, animals that are getting artificially sweetened foods um, gain more weight and eat more food. So there's something here that's happening on a more metabolic level that may not be uh, so good for the body. So it would be better to choose healthy sweeteners, things like fruit juice concentrate, brown rice syrup. Um, agave nectar happens to have a low glycemic index, but, you know, it is a processed sugar. All of the sugars uh, typically are. The closer you can get to the natural forms, whether it's a ripe banana or applesauce, you're going to be better off in the long run. So the other part of becoming aware is how are you eating? And really to focus on being more mindful, being more aware of how you're eating. And it does take 20 minutes for the gut to signal to the brain that you're full. So if you drag out your eating time a bit, that's going to be better for helping you to be more satisfied with the meal. I, I found it fascinating when I saw this research that um, there was a poll with a, a little bit more than 1,500 people, and it showed that most people, when they're eating meals at home, they're watching television. 91% of people are watching TV when they're eating. 62% are sometimes or often too busy to sit down and eat. 35% are eating lunch at their desk while they're working, and 26% eat when driving. That's not really safe, is it? So we're doing something else when we're eating, and if we were just sitting and eating, we might actually be more engaged and feel less emotional. Because you can imagine if we're watching television, we're seeing emotions there that might be impacting what we're eating and how much we're eating. It's really fascinating if you look at some of the research about social cues and, and things in our environment, how we're eating. There's a great book called Mindless Eating by Brian Wansink. Um, he did some research, and in this one particular study, um, they had people eating at an Italian restaurant. Five minutes after dinner, 31% of people leaving the restaurant couldn't remember how much bread they ate. And 12% of bread eaters denied that they had any bread at all. So people think they eat 28% less than they actually eat, and this tells us that there is a degree of mindlessness in eating, that we're not really paying attention. And how fast are we eating? This study in children showed that children that were overweight or obese were taking more bites per minute compared to children that were um, at normal weight or even lower normal weight. And what was interesting about this study is that 
the eating rates um, per minute, how many bites they were taking, was also correlated with their parents. So it just shows us if we're in the mode of moving fast, eating fast, and we're brought up that way and we're programmed that way, we are, are really potentially going to be taking in more food, changing our body composition. Uh, when it comes to, uh, I like a lot of these studies looking at children because it just tells you so much. When you look at television and diet quality, for each one hour increment of television viewing per day, there were higher intakes of sugar-sweetened beverages, fast food, red and processed meat, total energy, and also more energy from fat, trans fat, which is the bad type of fat and also lower intakes of the good things like fruits and vegetables, calcium and fiber. So especially when, when kids are young, you know, three-year-olds, more television viewing is associated with um, not, not so good dietary practices. So best to engage in more mindful eating, uh, the act of just simply being aware and paying attention to the current moment. It's not, it sounds a lot easier than it is, but if we can find ourselves in that space, then we can really tune into how our body feels, how we are emotionally, and then respond. And again, maybe it's just about being more curious. When we are more mindful, uh, studies show that it can help to reduce binge eating, this one particular study here. So I don't know if you've seen it, but there's kind of this slow food movement where uh, if you go to slowfood.com, you'll see that at restaurants, you know, there is this cultivation of just taking one's time, whether it's the food preparation, the food eating. When I lived in Europe, food eating and, and being at a restaurant was so different uh, compared to the States. And, of course, it depends on the United States where you are. But in Europe, it was just, gosh, sometimes you have to, like, really flag down the wait staff for the check um, because it just lets you enjoy and there's really no rush. So eating mindfully is um, is important here, right? I really want you to remember that. So number two, after we've become aware, whether it's through blood sugar or bodily awareness, our emotions, um, our, our sense of being mindful when we eat, now we develop alternatives. So we become aware, we figure out that we're eating emotionally. Now we have to figure out something to do in place of eating emotionally. So then you have to think, well, what else could you have to satisfy that need? There could be the 15-minute wait out. 15 minutes is a great period of time to distract ourselves into doing something else. So we can go for a walk, seven and a half minutes out the front door, seven and a half minutes back, and we're in a different mind state. Our body has moved. Maybe that emotion is not so strong. Maybe we also need to have more variety in eating. So um, making a choice. Uh, and then also making a healthier food choice whenever possible. So let's just say that, you know, gosh, we, we get this craving for chocolate, and one of the things that we can do is instead of choosing the sugary dairy chocolate, milk chocolate, we choose uh, something like dark chocolate. So we're still honoring this temporarily, and um, but it's an alternative. We're bringing in something else that might be a little bit healthier. We can also look at other um, activities. So instead of eating, how can we just work with our emotions, sit and journal, call friends, exercise, move, listen to music, uh, and maybe even just dance. You know, it's just great to have a song that's three or four minutes long, just dancing and just kind of going with the flow of that emotion. And then the last step is really finding the meaning. Why are we emotionally eating? What's the root? What does that food represent for us? What does that emotion represent for us? And what if we truly looked at the deeper, more symbolic meaning of food? What would we find? What kind of language would it speak to us? So when you start looking at the different cravings that are out there, um, really I think all of them center around some aspect of not being fulfilled. And it doesn't matter if it's spicy foods, chocolate, sweets, pasta, whatever it is, there might be some level of just not feeling fulfilled on some level. And with cravings, um, you know, there are so many different interpretations of cravings. Maybe it's more physiological, maybe it's more psychological, but essentially, um, you know, it could be pregnancy related, too many choices around us, colder weather, needing more carbohydrate. Um, but yeah, there, there might be a connection to emotions there as well. 
So I'll just take you through the the cravings very quickly in that um, because there there are multiple meanings of cravings. So let's just focus on the emotional, the potential emotional impacts of cravings, and they're all so different for everybody. So typically with chocolate, we think about just that feeling of being in love. It's kind of the the different psychoactive agents are just many times so uplifting. We get that good sense of um, you know, it, it just feels nice to, to eat the chocolate, and the feeling afterwards is is um, typically pleasant. But if we're emotionally eating chocolate, the studies show that it can result in prolonging a bad mood, very similar to what we see in other studies, where if we have too much in the way of a food that we know that we really shouldn't be eating, what tends to happen is uh, we start feeling bad. We start forming a, a more negative mood that, that keeps us kind of drowning in the whole experience of emotional eating. So instead of eating the chocolate, one option would be to start using affirmations. You know, what's really at the root? Is it because we feel like we want more love in our lives? And perhaps we need to start um, assessing what affirmations might be important for helping us to, to be in that state, to meditate on or to have in our environment. What about dairy? You know, I think of this as a very maternal substance. Maybe it equates with nurturing, needing to be loved or to be cared for. Um, and so thinking about that, if we crave something that's high in dairy, are we looking for more nurturing, more mothering? With salty snack foods, um, <laughs> if I just look at the, the foods, again, more metaphorically here, we're looking at more deep meanings, more symbolic rather than literal so salty snack foods, think about a pretzel, biting into a pretzel or a potato chip, kind of like the back-breaking stress that can be in our lives, that crunch. Or maybe it's uh, the anger, you know, maybe being connected to a sense of, you know, wanting to be noticed and crunching. And so what can we do? Um, well, you know, what about crunching on crisp vegetables? Um, different affirmations here, whether it's forgiveness, talking about taking care of yourself, being relaxed, letting go of any kind of stress might be important. Spicy foods. Um, I have noticed this with, with people that crave spicy foods. Um, there might be a sense of needing spice in their lives. So again, the deeper meaning. So needing the high, intense uh, experiences, pushing the envelope, blocking any kind of pain. Um, and so, you know, uh, some affirmations might be, Life provides me with abundant satisfaction. I meet my needs for excitement and stimulation. Uh, maybe it means going to see, as an alternative, going to see an exciting movie rather than um, too many spicy foods that may not be healthy. You know, there could be spicy foods that are very healthy. Breads, rice, and pasta. Now, this is a very common one. And when I think of the qualities of a lot of these very starchy carbohydrates, I think of Lots of, um, gosh, just it's a very comforting food, isn't it? When you sink into a piece of bread or pasta or just the coziness of rice, the rice dish. And so are we stressed? Do we need more care and comfort and kind of that squishy tenderness of just feeling like everything's okay? So some affirmations here might be, I am relaxed and trusting right now. I release my tension. So lots of different things. And you can create different affirmations to really work with those emotions. So the, the different foods, um, you know, they all have personal meanings. I'm just giving kind of a high level, kind of the standard garden variety of different sensations and meanings of foods that we might crave and we might tend to be drawn to when we're emotionally eating. But they can all be very different. So... Um, you know, the sense of fulfillment that we might be looking for. Well, if we look at the symbolism of the lack of fulfillment, you know, we, we move over to trying to fill the stomach in order to feel more content. Or with hunger, maybe instead of quenching a bodily need, we are really looking for um, kind of the, the meaning of life hunger. We, we are hungry for something more. We're, we're, we're craving connection. We're craving warmth. We're craving depth rather than uh, just looking at craving a particular food. There might be something much more there. So um, I like this, this quote, and just to leave you with this, uh, to bring us into the place of really reflecting now out and 
looking not just at nutrition, but really looking at nourishment. And that nourishment, every meal is really spiraling together the elements. And this quote from Sandra Ray, nourishment is certainly the least acknowledged of personal daily miracles. And so really putting us in that space of spirit, of gratitude, of thankfulness, again, becoming aware and, and zooming out rather than getting lost in kind of the chaos of emotions and emotional eating. And uh, that's why I, I like to also have more of a spiritual aspect to eating as well, that it does take on a, a sacred um, tone to it. You know, many in many cultures there's prayer before a meal or grace before a meal or giving thanks. And I think when we come at food and eating from that perspective too, it can take off a lot of the emotional charge. When we look at spiritual well-being, um, what we see is that there is a connection with helping to heal emotional wounds. This study from 2008 talked about um, attending to eating disorder patients' spiritual growth and well-being may help reduce depression and anxiety, relationship distress, social role conflict, and eating disorder symptoms. So there's something to be said there. All right, so just to summarize, um, there are these three steps that we just covered to combat emotional eating. Number one, to become aware. Become aware of the body, the emotion, stress, and how you eat. Number two, develop alternatives, whatever those are for you. Maybe they are uh, exercising or the 15-minute wait out, you know, moving yourself out of that situation for 15 minutes to come back into a different place. And then finally, looking at the deeper meaning of why you have these these connections with food and, and eating in certain ways and really moving through that process. So I want to thank you for, um, for being part of this webinar, for listening to it. And just to leave you with one of my most favorite quotes uh, from Adele Davis, we are indeed much more than what we eat, but what we eat can nevertheless help us to be much more than what we are. So I'd like to thank you for your attention listening to this webinar about the how of eating and looking at stress and emotions in our lives. And uh, my website is www.foodandspirit.com. And I'd like to thank Harmony Hill for their support of doing more in the way of nutrition and informing people connected to Harmony Hill on good eating and good health. Thanks so much.